and Charlotte is here as well. We're good to go, Carla. We're good to go. Are we? Are we? Okay, great, great. Ready to roll. Yeah, you see great me? See, yeah, I can. I can see and hear you. Great to see Steve with a beard. Wait, I'm mute. <laughs> mute. There you go. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. There's uh, quite a few of us. You know, you can ask questions here on the, on the chat, of course. Uh, welcome to the launch of Everything is Connected, Understanding a Complicated World, a book by David Newman, who's a friend for some of us and uh, uh, an author for some of you who haven't met him yet, uh, but uh, you will meet him through his book. Uh, I just, I'm excited about this book. I've uh, read it uh, before it's come out, uh, and I think it's an important book. Let's say, I mean, not just, uh, okay, I have, I have a trigger warning. Uh, David doesn't want gushing, so I'll try to keep it short. He just said no gushing allowed. So <laughs> I'll just do a little bit of gushing because it is an important book. Uh, not just because of the topics. I mean, we know the topics are sustainability, climate change, waste management. There will be talks uh, now and in the book about forests, the oceans, plastics, and very importantly, what about how everything is connected, which is connected through a lot of things, but money and greed as well. <laughs> we'll discuss how that factors in as well uh, with David. Uh, but I think what's important is that um, it's a poignant and timely book because we all know about uh, climate change here, I think. Uh, the way in which this is all uh, connected in uh, David's book, and especially the call to action that he makes, I think is quite inspiring and important, not just for us old fogies, but for younger for generations young. as well, who are listening as well. Uh, and so it goes across different generations, the, the call to action that David makes in a very clear uh, manner. And so uh, it's not just a great experience that he's accumulated in his 64 years, 30 of which are dedicated to, to the environment and to environmental campaigning, but it's, uh, it's uh, the clear thinking that comes in of putting, piecing together how everything is connected indeed. So for me, it's a pleasure to introduce him. You know, uh, David is uh, born in London, grew up in Australia, uh, went to Manchester University, He's been working for pulp and paper for a while and an interesting adventure in Iran. I hope you'll tell us about that with life-changing experiences he's had. Uh, he's been in Italy since 1985 for, for, for what, 30 years. That's where I met him. He was living in a rural area for a time and then he was director of Greenpeace um, and was working for Greenpeace for 13 years. But then he's also expanded his west, waste management experience, uh, becoming one of the leading advocates, especially in food waste. Uh, and now today he's in, back in London after two years in Jordan, so quite a cosmopolitan uh, CV you've got there, David. Uh, and he's one of the uh, has been nominated in 2020 as one of the top influencers in the UK for en the environmental sector, and he's in the policy steering committee for resources and waste with the UK government, which is an important place to be, because this is exactly what we will talk about today. Uh, enough of me and uh, turn it over to, to David uh, to please just tell us uh, what you want, but first of all, why you wrote this book. I think it's important to hear from you. Well, thank you, Carlo, and thank you to the panelists, uh, friends and colleagues listening in uh, all over the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you, an exciting moment, as you can understand for me, publishing a book. And, and thank you, Carlo, for your time, because I know that your own next book uh, is being published tomorrow, so uh, best wishes for that too. Um, why did I why did I write this book? And I, you know, I really think that a lot of things, almost in a way, as Trevor said, happened by serendipity, and they almost, in a way, happened by accident. But over the last years, people have said to me, and people listening in, and friends from from Italy, the UK, what do you do, David? What's your job? And, you know, people can say, well, I run a restaurant or uh, I'm a television producer or, or you know, I'm a, an artist like Trevor. But actually, it's quite difficult to explain what I do. And, and so when I thought about explaining what I do, I thought, actually, we better explain the context in which we live. And, and why I get up in the morning is to try to resolve a lot of these issues, the challenges around the context, is in, context in which we live. Uh, those are all the subjects which we, which we raise in the book. And then I thought, well, you know, all this is actually really complicated, Carlo, isn't it? Because, um, you know, climate change is enormously complicated. Um, but then 
when you think about all these issues and you realize that actually they're all linked together, the issues become very, very simple. So how do we communicate those issues in a simple language that's comprehensible, as you say, to various uh, geographies and various age groups uh, without overloading them with science, with academia, um, but giving them the resources as well to go further. And one of the things that, uh, that particularly I think Trevor said to me was, what a great resource book this is, uh, you know, because it's got 700 resources that you can go to access to find out more. Um, but we try to create a narrative which is easy to understand. Now, on this panel and amongst the audience, there are experts who know more about some of these subjects than I will ever know. Um, and the experts might say, oh, you know, you've swept over that a bit too much. Yes, but we try to keep a narrative going for people who are not experts. Um, and it's really quite important, actually, to get this message across to a public which is, which is not dealing with these issues every minute of the day like I am and most of these panelists are. And I think one of, the, one of the great techniques that you've used to do this has been to build macro stories that impact us, the way in which it communicates to us. So I think that was a very good technique that you probably spontaneously came to because I've been reading your yearly letter that you used to send us giving your vision of the world. And I was also impressed by the clarity of the, of the vision of how things were connected there. And I, I, I was happy to find it in the book as well. But now I, I think uh, we, sh we should hear not only why you wrote this book, but why the publisher published your book. So we have a message from the publisher, from Bill Gladstone. And maybe if Charles can put it on, we can just hear uh, not only why you wrote it, but why it's been published. So if that's ready, uh, and we can play yeah. that now. Yeah. Uh, no sound. We have no sound. Try again. That happens. Let's, let's give it another swear. Yep. Okay. Well, well let's see. Let's see if uh, if that gets fixed. Um, the, the technology, you know, it's, it's 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 fantastic, but it's made to screw us up, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but very nice. Yeah. Sure that. Here, yeah. let's try it again. No. I can lip read because I'm a little bit hearing it there. It said hello. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. But it worked, the funny thing is it all worked before, so it's really weird that it shouldn't be working now, but anyyway. Hello, my name is William Gladstone. I'm the publisher there you go. of Watershed Productions, the publisher for David's new book. Everything is connected. Understanding a complicated world. I am delighted to be serving as the publisher for this wonderful book. It's extremely well written and it's different from any other book you may have read about the environment. David points out that many of the things that people are doing that they think are helping aren't helping at all. This is a much needed addition to the many books that are being written about the environment. I've been fortunate enough to represent people like Paul Ehrlich. Michael Tobias, Hunter Lovins, Dr. Irvin Laszlo. And I've learned a lot about the crisis that we are facing. This book is going to make a significant contribution. You're going to enjoy the book. It's well written. There's fun incidents in the book. There's also some alarming information. Anyway, David, congratulations. I wish I could be with you today live, but please enjoy. And everyone who is listening, please go out and promote this book. Well, that's a very good point. I mean, <laughs> I think that that's exactly, exactly the point. Now we can, I would say, well, thank you for to Bill uh, Gladstone for, for the message. Uh, and I say we should just start and get into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, and please, I want to open it up to the panelists who have joined us. Uh, I want to list all of you, you're right here. Please, you know, if you want, intervene uh, if you have a question on the topic. I would just like to try to, to start back from the top, David. We're asking you a very simple, generic question with, about climate change, which is, are we doomed? Uh, listen, it's clear uh, that all the science says that we are heading to at plus at least five degrees centigrade by the end of this century. And I think that there is absolutely no doubt that we will be at plus two degrees centigrade 
at the end of this decade compared to pre-industrial levels. Um, that's, that's um, I think, a, a reasonably consolidated estimate. That is a terrible outcome for humanity, but of course humanity uh, will survive, a lot of us will survive, and the world doesn't end in 2100. The question is, what do we do between now and the next 30 or 40 years to actually turn that curve at some time in the future? Now, the book shows you how we got to where we are and how we can move forward to get back uh, to, a, um, to a climate and to an to to average temperature which we can all live. That may take a couple of hundred years. I may not be around to see the success of the policies that we put into place. But hey, we have an obligation to put those into place for the next generations. And, and speaking of those obligations, I had this prepared for later, but we had someone, Nick Garrod, who's asking a question about policy in a way. Uh, we've had eight years of Obama, now we've had four years of Trump. The question is, should we believe Trump, asks Nick Garrod. What do you have to say about that? Listen, uh, this was a question which uh, I, I, I was going to come to later. Um, it's, it's not my role as, 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 a, as a writer, as a British a citizen, to comment upon the choice of the American public. If they choose to vote for Mr. Trump as their president, then that's a, their sacrosanct right. And I have never met the gentleman, and therefore I make absolutely no comments upon him personally. That's up to his family and friends who have written books about it. Um, however, his, his policies are, are, are toxic for the American people. Uh, his policies are increasing uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, emission allowances for cars, for factories, for um, power production. They are debilitating the power of the Environmental Protection Agency. Once the leading light of environmental protection globally is debilitating the, uh, the, the capacity of the Environmental Agency to protect the health of American citizens, and his, his policies therefore have an impact upon the rest of the world because by accelerating climate change, that impacts all our health. So he may be a gentleman, he may be the president of the United States, all respect, but his policies are toxic for our health. Okay, well, that, that leads to another question. I mean, unless, uh, well, Nick Garrett says great answer, thank you. Uh, if the panelists want to come in on this topic, please just wave a hand and, and Charles can bring them in, bring any, uh, there you go, Sean, I think. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Carlo, I, I hope you can hear me. I just, I just wanted to flip that conversation for David and just say, obviously we've had some news very recently from China and making some very serious and substantial commitments. Do you think that perhaps China have the potential to make a dramatic impact for the planet in this way? Everybody, um, Sean, has got to do their part. Uh, the, the Chinese are, you know, 1.3 billion people out of the 7.5 billion people on the planet. So obviously they have a huge role to play. Um, one of the interesting things about China is that it's a top-down economy, isn't it? So if the, if the leaders decide to go that way, everyone goes that way. There's not a long, drawn-out democratic process to go through. You hit that direction and that's it. Um, so China can change things very, very quickly. Also, they have the industrial power to be able to help other countries implement those changes uh, around the world, and particularly where they are active in Latin America, and in, in Africa, and Southeast Asia, they are able to actually help the transformation of, of their economies into a low-carbon economy very, very much more quickly than we, for example, in Europe are able to. So yes, the Chinese will make a big difference. Um, we're still heading to five degrees, all right? So get that in your head. Oh, we have Charlotte with a question. Well, it's sort of, a, sort of along the similar themes of, as to what are the big things that are going to move the dial? And, um, you know, we've got to move that dial ridiculously fast. And, and one of the things that rightly as a theme runs through your book is, is the question of money, because everybody understands money. Um, not so many people understand value or price, uh, which is the big issue here, because we all fully understand here that, uh, natural capital, biodiversity are all things that should have way more value than the diamonds on, well, sadly not on my finger, but uh, on, on, on people's rings. Um, the, if we can move the money, that's a really fast way of affecting change. But how do we move the money? Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to read you just a short 
excerpt from the book, um, which is on the penultimate chapter about finance, okay? Um, and I hope that this will answer your question. Um, in May 2016, I was invited by the United Nations Environmental Assembly to speak at their meeting in Nairobi. I was asked to speak about, I'll try to um, be brief, I was asked to speak about waste management because I was president of the Waste Association. But when I went there, I spoke about tax evasion. There were some people in the audience who wondered what they were hearing. Tax evasion? Well, I received an enthusiastic applause, even though I'm sure a lot of people didn't quite understand it. Uh, and you can read that uh, uh, speech uh, in the link that's in my book. But in essence, what I said, Charlotte, is that here we are, scrabbling around in the dirt and the filth we pump into our environment, trying to find the money to clean it up, to build waste collection systems, proper landfills, recycling plants, sewage systems, ensure our oceans are not full of waste, and yet the money is never available. Where around the world, cities, governments, townships tell me the same story. It costs too much, Mr. Newman. The waste will go into the rivers. We're sorry. We're doing our best. And I estimated then that we needed, in 2016, about $60 billion a year to get the planet cleaned up from waste. Now, that's a lot of money, isn't it? $60 million. And here is the point. It is a tiny amount of money. $60 billion in 2016 represented just a half a percent of all the money hidden in tax evading offshore bank accounts in places like Panama, Bahamas, Guernsey, Monte Carlo, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and so on. $12 trillion was then held offshore in accounts avoiding taxes. So when you, when you analyze that, Charlotte, the, the way the money system is, 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 is skewed and the way we allocate our resources and the way in which we allow people to misallocate resources through, for example, tax evasion, answers your question. We have another question of uh, Charlotte, unless you want to follow up, or there is anybody else. Well, uh, the only comment, I mean, David, uh, just, you know, that's, it's a superb point that uh, obviously I've, working with David, I've heard before. So the key, the, 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 the secondary question then becomes, how do we make that happen? How do we, who is going to uh, ensure that the taxes are properly collected? Uh, and we do reallocate the money that Absolutely, I agree with you. It's there. We, we, we're certainly making the money available for COVID, so why can't we make it available for, uh, for, for this? Well, um, I don't want to bore you with long extracts, because also I want you to actually go and read the book rather than to, to have me read it to you. Um, but in the, in the last chapter, you'll talk about, uh, we talk about um, the politics of it all. Um, and uh, uh, you might you know, therefore ask me the question, how are we going to resolve this? How are we going to get the politicians to move more quickly? And, and I give a couple of tips. And, and the first tip is, you know, ask your candidate what their priorities are. And if the candidate does not say that your health is his priority, don't give your vote to that candidate because your health and environmental health are the same thing. And what can be more important than being healthy? What can be more important for a politician than improving the well-being of us citizens? So avoid voting for someone who puts business first because they will continue to want to reduce the controls on emission. They will continue to want to reduce the financial resources they pay to ensure our environment is clean. They will continue to want to reduce your rights to protest or to take action. And we've seen all these examples in recent years, from South America through to North America, the Middle East, etc. And business thrives even in the tightest regulatory regimes as we've seen in Scandinavia, Germany, France, Italy, Austria, Singapore, Korea, Tehran, and many others. California has the tightest environmental rules in the USA. But no one's complaining that it's hampering business there. So the second point is choose candidates who believe in international cooperation. Because you can't do this alone. You need to talk even to your enemies. Even the people you don't like who live near you, you need to talk to them. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, Charlotte, is that only through international co cooperation and only through negotiation are we going to solve any of these problems. And it's bloody messy. It's damn difficult. But that's why we created the whole United Nations system. That's why we created the European Union, to give people places to talk to each other rather than to shoot and fight each other. 
And one of the reasons why Mr. Mr. Trump's policies are toxic is because he is undermining this whole system of cooperation. Great. We have, we have one question which you basically already answered. Anu is asking, can we hear one solution to climate problem? You already gave two, I think. Uh, but if you want to uh, follow up on the question, Anus, uh, write a more specific one, and then we'll, we'll address it. But Filippo, who's uh, one of our panelists, is writing a question. Would you like me to read it, Filippo, or would you like to pose it directly? Oh, it's fine. It's the same. Because uh, one, one of the things he wrote in this book is that uh, uh, policy doesn't like uh, um, uh, scientific uh, evidence uh, and the dubbed is the the, the the big tide in this moment uh, in uh, especially in environmental uh, uh, in environmental issues and uh, and uh, when there is dubs uh, obviously policy and business make money but i don't think this is true for uh, european policy i think uh, the, the, the 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 scientific uh, Evidence are the, the the right driver of, poly, of uh, the, the the European uh, policies, and 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 uh, I think that um, Europe is doing a lot in this moment, especially in, uh, for uh, extended producer responsibility, and we are exporting our model in all over the world. Yes. So, so uh, David, David inspi inspired by the painting behind uh, Filippo, uh, uh, is Europe better at killing the dragon than uh, the rest yeah, of the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, the book talks about the, the need for strong government uh, because in the end, you resolve these problems through the democratic process and through strong governance. And it's quite singular that uh, the European Commission, which is the strongest collective government we have in the world is, is despised by many of the big corporations because it is strong enough to stand up to them. It has been strong enough to impose issues like Filippo spoke about extended producer responsibility, which these same corporations all over the rest of the world have succeeded in making fail. And so, yes, the European Union, the European Commission has been leading uh, the world on environmental policies. But Hang on, it's not perfect, uh, because democracy is not perfect. You know, we take two steps forward, we take one step back. Um, the European Central Bank recently uh, guaranteed loans for 7 billion euro for the world's major oil companies. Uh, the European car companies, especially the German car companies, are in there lobbying for incentives to buy more cars. Uh, I don't know where they come from, but that's, that's what they're there for. Uh, you know, that's, that's what they're trying. And, and the European Union listens to these people. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not perfect, it's messy, but if you don't get involved and you don't try, as many of the people on this panel and listening in do try every day uh, to fight for these things, um, the corporations will always win and the corporations will always try to weaken the control which governments have over them. Fortunately, Europe has been strong enough to impose policies on those corporations, but it is a daily fight. Okay, I, I have a question for Fred in a moment, but before I want to read you one from uh, someone who's listening in, Martin Kirsch, she's saying congratulations on your book. How do you view the activities of Extinction Rebellion? Uh, there are senior managers and directors I've met who feel they are more effective than NGOs and other organizations seeking change. Marcus. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for the question. It's a, it's a difficult one because, you know, uh, like Michael Nielsen, who's sitting here, uh, you know, we've been on the streets as, as activists for, for Greenpeace and we've been, you know, blocking roads and, and, and doing, you know, nasty things that Extinction Rebellion are doing today. Um, and, and I think the answer to your question is that if you want to make progress, you need everything. Um, and my book does point in the, in the chapter around politics is how uh, movements like Extinction Rebellion push forward the, the boundary and upset a lot of people. But what you don't see are the uh, environmental associations, the environmental lawyers like my, my wonderful wife who's listening in here, in the background, in the negotiating rooms, meeting with uh, uh, corporations, meeting with governments, being part of those negotiations going on every day across the world into, into issues. And that also is activism. And you don't see a lot of that. Um, that is that is just as important as being out on the streets and, and, and banging and making noise. David, we got another question. Uh, Stephen, in just a moment, mm -hmm. right after I read this, uh, Joanna Dupont Inglis 
is uh, has a question for you, which brings us back to the EU. How concerned, surprised were you when you heard yesterday from DGENV official how the EU's ambition is not backed up by sufficient human resources to deliver? Then we have Stephen with a question. Well, we had this problem, didn't we, in the United Kingdom? Uh, you know, the, the the environmental agency has been eviscerated by the last government. They don't have the people on the on the on the streets to control, um, and, and um, we have. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of activity around environmental protection now, but we often don't have the human resources to fulfil that. Um, and yes, I was very surprised to hear the, a poor, stressed speaker from the European Commission yesterday saying, "Mr. Newman, we'd like to do it, but I'm working 24 hours a day as it already is. So give me more staff, please. That's my major, That's my first request. Give me the staff to do it." <laughs> Great, thanks, Stephen. Oh, thank you. I was wondering how to, to, to introduce this, but Extension Re Rebellion did it for me. Um, recently, I, I, I wrote a paper about reviewing biowaste treatment in, in the UK, and it was published in the resource magazine, and, and I'm obviously involved in other people getting to know that. And I've had a, a letter from someone representing them to wonder if I would uh, sign an open letter. Uh, God knows what the letter will say. Uh, and I haven't followed it up, but I will. But the point I want to make is, David's book is truly extraordinary. Um, and it's well written, and it's well written. Uh, and when he, I read it, and I'm listening to his voice, and if there was an audio version of it, David should narrate it, because it just makes so much sense. But that said, my involvement is in the waste section, to be fair. But I think the waste section covers it as well because cradle to the grave. The ocean's full of plastic is about how waste is, is, is escaped. And I, I worked and did um, both from maternity to crematoria. So I know what cradle to the grave means. And uh, that was in Sheffield. But that said, um, and I'm going to connect it to David's view of mafia, which he shouldn't say because it's in his book. Uh, he doesn't mention the Gomorrah uh, in Naples, but perhaps that's another topic. But what he does say is the effort that he went to within Italy to persuade, legislate, regulate how composting and, and, its, and its collective nature of it should be to the extent that it is now. And we've got a problem in the UK. If, if it's a, not a problem, then, then forgive me, but it's certainly that we still put waste, organic food, green waste in landfill in quantity. And what we don't do is fund it to be avoided. Now, if you don't want tyres in, you don't want plasterboard, you don't want other things in, you ban them. But we, we didn't ban them, but we had something called bio-waste uh, bio directive that uh, sought to eliminate them. Now, I can connect in this to something else, and that's finance. If you leave it to someone to repair the problem other than governments, it won't happen, because the finance that they put in place is for profit. And if you look at all the major investment arms, looking at waste, looking at buying companies, KKR bought Virado for 4.2 billion because they were cleaning the oceans up? No, because they've got eight energy from waste facilities at 25 EBITDA, 25 million EBITDA a year. You've looked at Viola trying to buy Suez. Why? Because they're trying to buy energy, which is maybe 3 billion of 30% holding. So if you look at the investment profiling of major companies trying to get in or are involved in it, not one's mentioning what you're saying or we're saying or David's saying. And David makes the point, uh, uh, like you said, it's written in, a, in a such, a, such a manner that everybody reading it can understand it. It's the many tongues lang language. Anybody reading it from whatever intellect gets the same message. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. But I want to just Thank leave you with this point, and that is... Uh, and, I, and I re emphasize, Extinction Rebellion have asked me to be involved in something. Yeah, they got me, they, they wrote to me as well, Steve, yes. Anyway, sorry, I, 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 just, I just tried to find a link. So, next one, Bob, what can I say? But, uh, okay, Sean, you had some, uh, uh, a question, but before we get to Sean, uh, I just had a quick, uh, since there's been such a hagiography of David by Stephen, I, I, I have a question to Freak, uh, Frank, sorry. Uh, instead, who uh, I heard, Frank, that you said that uh, David is just a grumpy old man and not at all like the, as his <laughs> talent. So 
but would you like to address that before Manolito also entertains us in a moment after Sean's question? Uh, Frank. Hi, thank you. No, David knows it that uh, I read this chapter and said, David, you look like a grumpy old man and sometimes you seem very cynical uh, about the world or everything what you wish. At the same time, there is this red thread through the book that is full of passion and love and actually quite hopeful. But it's, it seems to be a consistent battle in this, uh, in this book. Well, uh, back to, let's say, my passion, uh, circular economy. Um, you notice very much that waste has a negative value. Uh, do you think that waste management can ever be uh, a change maker and a catalyst for a circular economy as long as we have this uh, negative uh, value? Uh, putting money into the system means it makes it political. Uh, what needs to happen, David? Yeah, well, uh, Frank, I mean, talking to you about waste is like talking to Ronald about football. Uh, you know, you know more than anybody else. Uh, so um, I will be quick for the audience who perhaps don't know about waste uh, because it is waste. What, why do we throw it away? Because it's worthless. And it, it's only when we actually put value on it through taxes or extended producer responsibility or whatever that we actually have the money to go and get it. Otherwise, we're all swimming in it. And the waste industry, to be fair, has been part of that process. But I would say that the waste industry has only been part of that process when the political momentum forced it to. And because the waste industry is like a it's like an elephant, it's, and dancing, it's, it's dancing with it's, uh, it's like dancing tango with an elephant. You're going to get your feet trodden on all the time. Um, because it's a very capital intensive, slow, technologically slow to move industry. And therefore it doesn't want abrupt change. It wants to build an incinerator that for the next 30 years will lock, lock in waste and burn, 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 because it, that's the way it makes money. So if you tell them, no, you can't do that in five years' time, you've got to start composting everything or making biogas from it, uh, they've got huge stranded assets. And so you can understand that they can't move quickly. But the role of activists and the role of government is to look after the public health, not after the accounts of the major waste companies. Okay, we have some other questions, but I think Sean had a, a question. Am I correct? I saw you raise your hand before, or? Hello, you yes. mean me? No, yes. I don't have a question. When the, when the time is right, I just want, I would love uh, a moment to, to make some observations, that's all. Okay, sure, you sure. Tell me Please when. write to me. In case I don't see you, I saw, I saw Tony. Uh, who has a question, said, but if I don't see you, please just write me a message and then I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. Tony? Okay, um, I would just like to say thank you, David. I've only got to 40%. So um, on the basis, my children, who are four and eight, ask me every day, Daddy, what do you do? I'm looking forward to getting to the end and being able to answer the question. <laughs> um, um, and I'd also say, Trevor, that the picture behind you is quite intimidating, for the, for, certainly for me. Um, <laughs> um, what role um could and rather should the media be playing in this at the moment we and especially in the uk we live on in a world where it's balance um as far as i understand coming from the green roots i do there, there is no argument for balance in this um it is a it's a proven the whole thing is proven so should the media be banned from claiming so-called balance from the one percent of naysayers that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I just want to join a similar question. So, Mar uh, so David, you can address both. Sa Sandy Martin is mentioning the fact that some years ago, Rupert Murdoch had a moment when he seemed to recognize that his great-grandchildren would suffer from environmental degradation too. But then that moment passed, unfortunately. In reference to your question to the media, Tony, might one useful initiative be to try to persuade the currently most anti-environmental actors to take pollution and climate change seriously because it will affect them personally. So I just thought I'd, we, we answer these questions on the same topic. Ah, Tony, that's a difficult one. I, I mean, I, I'd almost throw it back to Carlo because Carlo is, is one of... Uh, oh, blame it on me. You know, one of the leading journalists in, in Italy where I worked for many years and is, and is, is still a, a lead journalist. But let me make... Um, yeah, a couple, just a couple of comments, and then Carlo, Carlo, I would actually ask you to, 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 to think about a response as a journalist. Uh, you know, why don't we write more? Why, why is there this necessity for balance when the whole question is not balanced at all? Um, and and there's, 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 there's two things here that I would say. And, and firstly, in, in some jurisdictions, 
we do allow people to own the media who don't have a stake in the country. And this is particularly true in the United Kingdom where all, almost all our um, main media is owned by people who are not resident in the country, don't pay taxes in the country, have no stake in the country, but influence the politics of the country. And, and I think that if we're, if we're going to have a media that reflects the, uh, the concerns of citizens, you have to be a citizen, you have to own, you have to be a citizen of the country and live in the country and pay taxes in the country to own media, which influences the country. And I think that it's, it's I think governments around the world do have those rules, Carlo, um, that, that you, you cannot be a controlling influence. I think in the United States, you cannot be a controlling influence of the media unless you actually are a, a resident there and pay taxes there. So that, that's, that's one thing. So it, it comes down to finance again. Uh, but the other thing is that, you know, if you look at a newspaper, who's taking out the publicity, Tony? Who's taking out the advertising? Who's buying the advertorials? Well, it ain't me, I can assure you. You know, I struggle to pay my taxes. But Exxon Mobile and Chevron and uh, whoever um, will be. Uh, that counts. So look very briefly about the media. I don't want to take time at all, but uh, uh, when I covered Greenpeace and uh, all the activities that we shared uh, in the 90s, the Greenpeace was able to bring attention to the topic. So the media can't be blamed all the time for not covering. It covers what interests people actually. So now, thanks to Friday for Future, Extinction Rebellion, I think this is forcing the media to look into this again. And so the coverage has increased, honestly. So it is, uh, protest works. Uh, it does bring attention. And so I think you do have to have peaceful protests to force the media to pay attention to you and to talk about it. Because if you expect the vested interests that are behind the ownership of the media to encourage the journalists to write about it, I think you will, uh, we will be extinct by then. One question from, then I, we have Sean, but one question from Ersan Kalafatoglu, the, saying, saying that everything is connected, not connecting, the title of the book is Everything is Connected. Uh, the current environmental situation indicates that there is a missing link between the scientists and policymakers. So David, is the missing weak link within the scientists or the policymaker? Which one? No, no, I don't think it's neither. Um, Carlo, everybody's playing their part. Everybody does what they are paid to do. You have to understand the politicians and Sandy Martin is listening in. He's been a, 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 a shadow spokesman for the, for the Labour Party in Parliament on environment in, issues. Um, you know, politicians don't come from our background. Um, they are generally speaking, not maybe they may be a medic or they may be a lawyer. Suddenly they find themselves as a spokesman for the environment or for, for agriculture. They know nothing about it. Um, so they have to rely upon uh, policy experts. They have to rely upon people like you see sitting around this table here to give them advice. Uh, but they have to also listen to a whole range of, of, of stakeholders from industry to science to uh, activist groups, etc. cetera. Um, and, and this is why it's really important that when you vote for people like Sandy Martin or, or, or other people to your parliament, you have to ask them the question, is my health your priority? Because if the answer is, mm, well, maybe, but, you know, we have to get jobs first, don't vote for them because those people are going to make the wrong decisions and are going to come to the wrong outcomes. And this is what we have, in, sadly, in many countries around the world now. We haven't asked that question. Great. We have more questions and we have also Sean. What about Mono? There's Mono. I would like to listen to Mono. Yes, exactly. I was about, about to bring him in. We've been in for 40 minutes now, so we're ready for a break, which is very uh, connected to everything is connected. So I turn it over to Manolito. Hello. Thank, thank, you, thank you for inviting me, David. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's, it's very, very, interesting, uh, very interesting to listen to all of it and um, to be able to compose something purely on... Uh, you know, on, on the kind of the, the outtake from your book, you know, the, the, the first description, the first read. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see from somebody who is, who is very, um, I don't know, unaware, I would say, what I've come up with in this particular poem. So it'd be interesting what you guys hear. Would you like to hear it? Let's go. Go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, so this is called Your Priceless Cargo. Your excessive packaging fills our sea. No coral or fishes, but packaging for thee. 
plastic, paper and rubber, said the leopard seal. Ow, cried this particular orca, you're making us feel ill. So along came that ominous ship on that misty morn, carrying its very loose load, ice sheet after ice sheet being torn. Sleepy was the skipper on that Sunday morn, when the waves began flowing over the bridge to the sound of his mayday horn. Cargo slipped simply straight over as the crude oil began oozing out. The belugas screamed, the narwhals groaned, the humpback simply cried out. This is our home, we need it nice and clean, your greed is killing us, your wealth is obscene. So quickly it happened, as we all watched you get saved, your insurance paid out, but you're karmically enslaved. But for us, this watery grave. So this is a glimpse of what it could be if you swam with us in the deep blue sea. Now how's about that? Made effortlessly. <laughs> thank you thank you we needed that thank you <laughs> you're welcome you know, thanks mono well, you know you should you should know that i met mono fishing a few few weeks or a couple of months ago and uh, he told me he was a rap poet and i thought well come on uh, you don't know anything about this stuff so enliven our day and you have thank you no thank problem you, thank you very <laughs> good of a wider scope that that that's quite important to communicate also through the art absolutely thank you for for adding that to us sean up to you now bring us back to the prose. <laughs> uh, please uh sorry unmute sean sean sutherland there you go yeah thank you what an act to follow oh my goodness um i I just wanted to say a, a couple of things about how David's book made me feel. Um, don't worry, David, this is not going to be too gushy, but gird your loins. In just four words, David's book set me on a path to clarity. Who benefits? Who pays? Those provocations start to unravel the tight and complex knot of the mess my generation has created and the pivotal levers we need to slam into reverse to create the change we need. As ever, David's clear thinking, no bullshit, pragmatic approach, and just as somebody else said, you hear him speaking all the way through this book, carries us through every page, connecting the dots, so we are all made aware. And the more I read, the more I realize the madness of not just the situation we find ourselves in now, but our ignorance of it. It's too easy to be overwhelmed to think that having any kind of responsibility is beyond us. Just getting through the day, coping with our own lives is enough, but it isn't. Our ignorance is shameful. We think it is progressive that children learn computer sciences at school now, and yet we all know so little about the incredible world we live in and how to restore it so that it continue, can continue to care for us. We won't have healthy humans on an unhealthy planet. We know this, and yet we carry on blithely, expecting someone else to fix the problems we have all created. Ignorance is not an excuse, and I applaud David for taking such extraordinary pains to research in detail every issue that impacts and shows us how connected everything is. David has always been a sage to our team at A Plastic Planet, always there for us to keep us on track. Stick with the science, it is enough. He has told me this so many times. And irritatingly, he's pretty much always right. And now I've read his book, I know why. The truth hurts, Mark Twain tells us, but silence kills. It is time for all of us to speak up and this book empowers us to do so with confidence. To be honest, it's a legacy I envy and aspire to. So my final words I take from David's lion-hearted imperative. Be positive, be optimistic, but above all, be active. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Very Sean. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, you. Thank you, David. You're the man that did all the work. Yeah. This is your gift to us. <laughs> and and I, see, I see Trevor nodding, and I would like, speaking of the art, uh, to bring you in and ask you, uh, Trevor, please, to share what your uh, experience as a fresh reader 
of this book has been? What was your impression and, and how did you respond to it? Uh, well, first off, I'd like to say, uh, well, first, congratulations to my dear friend, David. I think it's an extraordinary work. Um, I, I must admit, this is the first book I've actually read online. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a, a hard copy man. And um, I, was, I was a bit daunted by it initially. Um, but then I realized what, how brilliant it was reading it online because of the wealth of resources. I, I mean, a, a really staggering amount of background material that is presented in... Um, and um, presented with the links, but, but the visuals, I found that the choice of graphics, the simplification of the diagrams, um, the clarity with which all that was um, presented was really quite extraordinary. Um, the optimism that runs through it, you know, I think I, I noted here, David starts out, you know, do we intend our extinction as an outcome of our behavior, you know? Um, and then he just goes from there with his, his, his serious optimism that carries the day, I think. So, um, you know, I know, as David says, it's very difficult to answer the question, what do you do for a living? I'd say, um, well, you make the world a better place, David. And thank you so much for it. Amen. Yeah, great. Thank you, thank you. No gushing, that's enough gushing. Enough gushing. Uh, <laughs> speak, speaking of, pre speaking of Trevor, thank you. Uh, oh, may I just, sorry, Carlo, I just wanted to Please say, um, I just by chance, you know, we've all been talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the terrible loss. And um, I just happened to have a large portrait of Sandra Day O'Connor hanging around in the studio. So I thought I'd I'd give her a little, you know, nod to being the first woman to break that glass ceiling. So, uh, yeah, so that's that. That's what's behind me, Tony. <laughs> great, great. Cool. Uh, I'd like to talk to Michael exactly. Uh, uh, but uh, picking up on on Trevor uh, reading his first ebook, Charlie Trousdale asked if there will be a paper book. Uh, David, uh, online is great, but old-fashioned book, although yeah. it wastes paper. Uh, would be fantastic as well. What is your answer? And then yeah. I want to move to Michael. Yeah, no, uh, um, you know, quite, on, quite honestly, the publisher has said that this year, uh, with, you know, uh, a lot of the bookshops having been closed, there's a, there's a huge backlog of, of authors um, far better known than myself, like Carlin, uh, who are waiting to be published in print, uh, and they, they will get priority. Um, but should the book sell reasonably online, then uh, an updated version of it may be printed next year. However, um, I, I take up what Trevor says. Um, I think by reading it in paper, you will lose a lot of the access to the resources um, and to the, uh, and to the uh, quality of the graphs and, 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 and the images in it, because this is also a pictorial book. Um, that uh, you know, black and white on a piece of paper just won't be as good. Um, and so, uh, you know, young people today, they don't buy books. They do everything on a, on a screen or on their phone, so it's perfect for them. And the older, the older people who want a book will either, you know, wait for it or get with the times, folks. I think, as we mentioned, Michael, he is, he is, he's escaped uh, here, the, the panel, for a moment. Let's see if we can get him back, because I think he's, <laughs> uh, he's got disconnected. If Charles can see if he can, can connect him back, I wanted to, to bring him in uh, with his long experience since the 90s or more uh, to, to draw a connection, perhaps. Uh, uh, while we're doing that, Kai, while we're waiting for Michael to come back, I just wanted to make a short reading uh, on the chapter on plastics, uh, because Perfect. Sean has mentioned plastics, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a plastics and waste management, climate change, of course, they're all linked. So here's a, here's a, here's a short couple of paragraphs from the, from the, the, the book about the plastics uh, uh, issue. As the Venice campaign in 1996 has shown, I've personally and professionally been seen to be, and, and I'm happy to be seen to be, an enemy of the plastics industry. I've worked in several capacities against the wasteful, senseless, unconcerned placing of billions of tons of plastics onto the market with no plan, investment, or interest in ensuring public environmental and animal health. The plastic people simply couldn't care. Ask them to pay for the damage they have done, and they tell you, Offensive, you're irresponsible, you're putting jobs at risk, you want to make things worse, you got the figures wrong. 
their favorite story is to tell you that really the plastics industry is recycling loads of plastics and that the plastics you see in the seas all come from Asia where they don't collect it. In other words, it's someone else's fault. Um, this, those preventing the taking of responsibility for the materials in the plastic industry range from the representatives of their industrial associations to the giant users like the soft drinks companies that churn out billions of single-use bottles without even so much as wondering about where these end up and blaming you, a citizen, for littering. They knew all along what they were doing. The evidence for this contained in an excellent piece referenced here, relevant to the United States, but not just, is overwhelming. They took every possible measure to distract your attention away from the disaster they were making by talking about recycling. It was a deliberate strategy, and more shockingly, governments were stupid enough to fall for it. We all fell for it, and we are still falling for the distractions they use. In the USA, producers of packaging have opposed every possible move to make them contribute to towards the recovery and treatment of those products when they become waste. The American Institute for Packaging and Environment, AmeriPen, spoke in a lawsuit on behalf of Pepsi-Cola, 3M, General Mills, Procter & Gamble, Nestle, McDonald's, and Dow Chemicals, among others, successfully opposing such a bill in the state of Washington. In the UK, we have our own ink pen, which represents similar interests in the name of the environment. Who benefits and who pays? Well, you just uh, you just sold another um, another copy of the book because Anu is writing. I am ordering the book. There is a chapter on plastic. Thank you. So <laughs> uh, I think we lost Michael, but uh, uh, we have Mar Marco. We have Marco Versari with us, who is from Novamont and a very old friend from Italy too. There we go. Uh, is there oh, there, you you. there you go. Would you like to share an experience, uh, uh, your experience with the book, Marco, or? The, I, I, so, David, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, uh, we shared uh, a, a lot of things uh, in the past. Uh, uh, David was the first director of the uh, Italian uh, Biodegradable Plastics uh, Producer and Converter Association. So is part of our history since the very beginning. So he knows very well uh, what uh, biodegradable and compostable plastic are, the role, the, the, the role that they can play the, the, uh, in, the, in the separate collection of food waste. So uh, uh, he explained very well uh, about plastic and biodegradable plastics. Uh, we are not the solution of the, we are the, not the holy grail, but uh, the biodegradable and compostable plastic industry can play a very important role at uh, European level regarding uh, the circularity. So, uh, but what we impressed me, and I don't want to bother the, the floor, but what is impressed me is uh, money uh, connect uh, everything and everything is connected so, uh, the money not because uh, is the money we have but uh, how money and how we use money can generate something very positive or, or, or very negative for example subsidies how we use or not use subsidies in, in, in a proper way or in a wrong way. So the subsidies on, uh, on uh, palm oil, for example. So the idea of uh, renewability or the renewable resources, how we use the money to push some technology or other. So uh, this is, we have to think, uh, and th thank you, uh, David, to, to I would say to underline that money, good or bad, not as money itself, but how we have to use money in the proper way to to select the right outcomes. The right outcomes. Yeah. yeah. You know, Marco, we we need four trillion dollars a year to 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 
clean up climate change. It's a, it's a huge amount of money. It's 5% of global domestic product. But we spend nearly $6 billion, $6 trillion a year on subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So I think a lot of people listening here probably are more intelligent than me, but let me just repeat that. We need $4 trillion a year to clean up the climate change mess. We spend $6 trillion a year on subsidizing the fossil fuel. Now, I thought the human beings were an intelligent species, but sometimes I have my doubts. Maybe it has to do with the incapacity to actually look at the cost of destruction, David? Sure, if you don't price in the externalities, um, and uh, you can do this, for example, through carbon taxes, through material taxes, uh, but if you don't do that, uh, dumping is free, Carlo. Trashing is free, destruction is free. But if you don't, you have to price that in. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the, the polluter's worst nightmare, isn't it, a carbon tax. Um, and, and I say in the book that ExxonMobil um, employees uh, go, to, go to bed at night wondering whether they're going to get the carbon tax that Sweden has, which is 125 euro a ton. Um, and, and they fight in, in every possible jurisdiction to make sure there isn't a carbon tax, to make sure there isn't a cost of pollution. But it's the allocation of money and the way in which we spend it and, the, and, and where we get that money that will change the way in which we live. And that will come through politics and that will come through you listening, getting active and taking part. Well, listen, it sounds convincing because Joanna and Anu are writing they've already ordered the book as you spoke. But we have another interesting question from Karin uh, van der Peel, uh, which is very timely about COVID. The impact of COVID on environmental issues has been both positive and negative. People are traveling less, but at the same time, we have seen an increase of single-use plastic, face masks, and more. We've all noticed that. A slacking of laws around emissions and diverting budgets to medical response. This is a tough question, but how do we balance environmental problems with medical priorities? Good luck. Yeah, well, uh, the, the physicist Niels Bohr once famously said, um, making predictions are very difficult, especially if they're about the future. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to make any predictions about the future. And Karen, thank you for, for, for your question and for your, for your help over the years. Um, but I come back to what I say in the book. If your politicians representing you are not concerned about your health, they will make these mistakes. If they are concerned about your health, environmental health must be for them a priority because your health without environmental health is impossible if you live on a if you breathe bad air if you drink poisoned water if you eat poisoned food uh, if the forests are, are destroyed and the and the and the and the bacteria jump from animals to, to humans you will be sick we will be sick and we are living through irresponsible actions which which we have allowed to happen in our name how that will pan out well, people predict that there are thousands of other bacteria waiting to jump out of the forest that we're destroying at the moment, that we will have uh, at least every two to three years new pandemics. Um, and so we have to ensure that the people who represent us when we go into that polling booth understand this and put our health as a priority. And then a lot of things will sort themselves out. Great. Great. We, we are now at six o'clock, uh, uh, but uh, I wish we could go on for another hour or so. If you have, among the panelists, if you have questions uh, that you'd like to ask, I hope that we can uh, steal a few more minutes. I mean, if there are, please just wave and let me know if you have, or send me a message. Uh, we are kind of running out of time, but if there is anyone who wants to add, uh, or David, you want to add something, we are, we are at the end of our uh, about our hour. I think I think an hour I think an hour is enough because uh, yeah. you know, otherwise I'll read the whole book. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, let me say, um, uh, Carlo, again to you. Thank you for dedicating your time to me and to and to us all this afternoon, um, and to my friends and colleagues, uh, some of whom I've worked with now for for twenty years, uh, who are on the panel today, and to uh, those um, those people who are listening in and. and uh, you know, uh, you're not going to make me rich by buying the book, but I hope you make your culture richer, and I hope that you get the book around to people um, as a gift. You can email it to them as a gift. Uh, you can suggest to them that they, that they read it. 
And, and those of you who teach in schools or in universities, suggest it to your students. Uh, Exeter University, for example, is, is, is running it for its, its student classes on sustainability. Uh, and of course, they don't buy books anymore, Charlie. They buy only e-books. Uh, so you know, this is this time. So, so it, as Bill Gladstone, the publisher, said, um, this is about the message. This is about our future, and, and therefore read it, please. Yes, and you know, we have a, a listener who just written something about the fact that she thought because of your background, this would be mostly about plastic, but now she discovered it a lot, about a lot more. So she's buying the book. I just want to remind that there are also, we, we talk a lot about waste management and plastics, of course, climate change, but there is very fascinating chapters in, on the forest and fisheries on the oceans. I just thought even the, the graphs and the research you've done is impressive. So this is a very comprehensive book. Let's remember, we did talk a lot about plastic and, and waste management, but there are fascinating chapters, uh, not just on how the money can go either to help the environment or to damage it as, as it is now, but also on, on, uh, on, on the forest. One final uh, thing on the forest, and David, what is the biggest misconception on, on, on the issue of, of management of the forest? And then we can close it. Because I just yes. want to get a little more from you. Yes, I think, um, uh, you know, once again, the resources, uh, if, uh, particularly when forests are owned by uh, governments who then don't enforce their ownership, as in, as in Latin America. Uh, everything is up for grabs and everything is free. There's no price on it. Um, and so we're seeing the disaster which we're seeing in, in, in the Amazon uh, today. Uh, and that is repeated across Africa and across Southeast Asia. Um, but it's not all bad news. Actually, forest um, destruction, the rate of forest destruction is declining. And the rate in which countries are planting new forests across the world is quite astonishing. Uh, the, um, the African Green Wall is, is quite some enterprise. It's, it's a 16-mile it's a wide uh, wall of, of trees that runs from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. Quite astonishing. Um, the, the number of trees planted in, in China every year to hold back the Gobi Desert is absolutely stunning. And, and, and so... There's, uh, Europe today is 50% more forest cover than it had 50 years ago. So it's not all bad news. Um, again, it comes down to the, the question of ownership, it comes down to the question of politics and to interests. Um, and uh, unfortunately, those things, they take steps backwards sometimes. And, and in, certainly in Brazil and Amazonia, we're living in a period where they took steps backwards. Whatever you said has convinced Frack, who has written great work and proud of you. So you're not just a grumpy old man. And Charlotte is uh, writing here, here. And Anu is starting a book club uh, around your book, we just said. So uh, I think that uh, this is a stimulating conversation. It will continue. There are many questions coming in, but now I think we may be out of town. Paolo Lascola is asking, how do we combine jobs and environmental policy, a big one? I don't know if we have time. Uh, Listen, I, I think when people are, are, are had enough, they will leave. Um, and, and please please feel free to do so. I, I would just say on that, uh, Paolo, that we can see um, the, the, the transformation of economies over the, the last two centuries. Um, every time there is a transformation, uh, those with the, the, the technologies which are about to become redundant have always said, what are all these people going to do? How are we going to find them jobs? Um, you know, now it's robots. How, uh, robots are going to take over everything. 25 years ago, it was computers. Computers are going to take over everything. And, you know, and, and, and until uh, COVID-19, uh, Western Europe and, and the United States, uh, the OECD countries had full employment, full employment. And yet everyone's got a laptop and the laptop is going to put everybody out of, out of jobs. So te technology uh, requires people, it requires skilled people. And don't worry, I'm not worried about people's jobs. There will be plenty of jobs. And by the way, population, uh, uh, population growth has slowed dramatically uh, and, and in 2050 population will start to decline globally. So don't worry about that. Great, great point. Uh, the news I have to reveal to you, I've already put you in my bibliography of my book, which is coming out tomorrow. So I'm sure it will happen a lot because this is a great reference and, and, and it's Thank going you. to be game a game changer. A lot of readers are, are, and listeners are, and future readers are, are writing a lot of congratulations on the, on the comments and, can read, uh, and thank yous. Uh, I think we can, we can wrap it. I want to thank the panelists, Sean, uh, Trevor, uh, Frank, thank you for changing your mind, T Tony, uh, Charlotte. And Michael, Filippo, Marco, oh. thank you for being here. And uh, over to David for the final uh, uh, goodbye message. And I thank okay. you for, for, for this very well, fascinating discussion. Thank you all. Thank and, you, David. And I, I thank you. And I, and I will see you all shortly. You're all friends. And we, we will run into each other in the next few days. Thanks for your time. And thanks, thanks for your help and, and for your promotion of this message.
Thank and you. thanks, Manolito, for the great poem. Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> Ciao, Good job, uh, David. Uh, all the best. Thank you, Thank you yeah. everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, David. Great stuff. Ciao. Great. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Carlo. Everything is connected. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> Disconnect. <laughs>